Okay. <clears throat> well, ladies and gentlemen, if we could settle down once again, because we are beginning right now. Okay, so for our next speaker, he'll be speaking on managing our emotions, knowing what we truly want in life. Okay, and it's really getting at the heart of what we are really looking out for. So what is it what does it mean to manage our emotions, of course? And speaking on this will be uh, Dr. Chan Kuang Ji, who was speaking yesterday as well. I, those of us who were here will remember his memorable anecdotes about leaving his passport uh, behind in, in, in one city while he was uh, away, and then how he managed to, to keep calm, right? To keep calm and carry on. In fact, I, I have that motto right there on my phone. I need to, be, to learn from and to be inspired by Dr. Chan. So he's the inter internationalization lead of the School of Medicine at Griffith University. So if we could all give a big hand to Dr. Chan Kuang Ji. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I'd really like to thank uh, everyone for staying so late. Uh, my sound has changed to be even more amazing now because uh, I think I, ha well, I, had, I had the cold before I bought the plane to Singapore. So, yeah, this is very interesting sound. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, this is all, this, all this background thing is just to intimidate people. <laughs> That's the whole point of it. Um, I realized that I realized the necessity of that in my first talk in Singapore. That was 2001, 2002. Uh, I was invited to talk at Xinjiabo for Wangzhan. So the moment when I walked out of the lift, my mum was with me. I was talking about life and death studies, Sheng Si Xue. So I was taking my luggage. My mum was walking at the front. Everyone saw my mum and thought that my mum must be Zheng Guangzi Yisen because she looks old enough to talk about life and death. <laughs> So they all rallied around my mom and said, Yo, Zheng Yisen, welcome, welcome. And so I was, I was at the back dragging the, the luggage. <laughs> and then back then, the, uh, the abbess of Singapore for one time, she knows me. So she was at the far end of the building. And she went like, Zheng Guangzi. And then all the people are like, Ah, Zheng Guangzi. <laughs> they go back. So from there, I learned, you know, you, you either need to have a big company or 600 branches in China, or, <laughs> or you need to have some fake you know, qualifications for people to listen to you. <laughs> okay, so before I start, um, this is what I always do in Australia when you have important talk. I would like to acknowledge the tra traditional custodian of the land on which we are meeting and pay my respect to the elders past and present and extend the respect to all Aboriginal and uh, in, in, in Australia, you say Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. In this context, I would like to expand my re respect to all Aboriginal people. So the reason that whenever you give an important talk, you need to do a uh, acknowledgement of country is because it's about connection. It's about where we are in this present moment. It's about acknowledging history from the past being at the present, that's how you can see towards the future. So this is, this is very important for me, and I only learned about that when I got to Australia, because there's huge conflict and divide between communities. The Aboriginal communities in Australia is still suffering from health. They are literally, um, they live shorter, they are much poorer. Uh, the jail is, uh, has an over-representative of population of Aboriginal people in Australia. So this is something that we need to work on. So how does, that make, how, does that make, how does it make sense doing this in a, in a symposium like this? Because I think in order for us to handle disruption, it's very important for us to really take account of where we are now, what is going on. Then we can move from there. So first of all, gratitude to the organizers, gratitude to all the amazing speakers. Uh, when I got the program, I realized I'm the last one speaking. You know, sometimes you say, hello. Sunday, you know, what time now? Three o'clock. <laughs> I uh, chama. <laughs> or you can have another, you can choose another approach that is, wow, I'm the last one. I get to listen to everyone before me. And then you know what? I can say whatever I want and they can't say anything about it. <laughs> how good is that? <laughs> so, so this is how you decide. How are you going to frame the state of your mind? What are you thinking? Where do you, what, what do you want to do? So that's what I think. I said, oh, it's good. 
So today, the whole day, I was sitting out at the back making notes, listening to different pre uh, uh, presentations. But, but I, I don't want to offend anyone now, so I don't have a slide like saying that I'm not going to offend anyone. I don't have that slide, don't worry. <laughs> okay, but I do want to answer a quest, one of the statements, that is, do we need religion? This is the latest Australian census data from 2016. You can see that the population that doesn't have a religion has now preceded as the biggest individual group in Australia. So this, all this grey uh, part, they are Christian, but they're different sectors of Christian. There is Catholic, uh, there is Mormons, uh, there is uh, uh, Orthodox, uh, all sorts of different Anglican, all these different uh, Christian belief in there. But atheists has now became the biggest group in Australia. <laughs> okay, did you just declare that you're atheist? <laughs> oh, welcome, we love you. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is amazing. You all, did you all record that? Huh? That is just gold, you know. Okay, so, so, so someone asked me uh, just now over lunch, what is the future of Buddhism? in Australia. I said the future of Buddhism in Australia is looking great because the biggest population now is atheists. And I think Buddhism is one of the only religion or philosophy that can actually have a communi can actually communicate uh, with the atheist, uh, atheist community. So do we need religion? Well, institutionalized religion, I'm not sure, but I definitely uh, agree with uh, the professor earlier today that we all have need of religion in us. Depends on how we, do, how, we, how we describe that. So, I was sitting there, I thought, okay, today I'm not a Buddhist scholar. Well, I've never been a Buddhist scholar. So what can I bring to this discussion? Well, coming from my profession, I'm a medical educator. What is big in medical education for these past few years is called interprofessional learning. And suddenly, I had, a mo I had an aha moment this morning, you know, all this aha moment. An aha moment, I was sitting there, I was like, you know what? Buddhism needs to learn from interprofessional learning. Why? Because the monks and the reverends are like the doctors in the health system. But the doctor cannot do everything. You need nurses, ma. you need physiotherapists, you need all these other professions to come in and help you to do a good job. I'm sorry I'm starting to speak like English now. I blame it to you. <laughs> but people actually like it, you know. When you say, yes la, no la, hey me, like that, uh, they laugh. <laughs> okay, so, so they actually, it's actually something quite important that we need to look at. It's not always just about the doctor. It's about the team. It's about how do you broaden out and make things successful. And I think Ji is an amazing example. Ji's achievement in charity, in altruism, and uh, I get goosebumps whenever I see those amazing pictures. And I do agree with uh, Professor He when he said yesterday that does the thought result into the changes or does the action result into the changes? And he said, he said that the action results into the changes. And I actually agree with that. So does it mean that thought doesn't result to changes? It does too. For me, both does. But in a lot of situations, I think a lot of people actually require to immerse themselves in that action, to actually be there in that disastrous environment, connect with the suffering, and through that process actually evoke deep down change of behavior. So it's brilliant, it's actually brilliant. Uh, as a medical educator, we call that simulated learning. <laughs> simulated learning means that you need to simulate a situation for the student to get used to how to do a uh, cardiorespiratory resuscitation before you actually release them to the clinical world. So what we're doing now, everything that we're doing, we're simulating to be a bodhisattva. That is simulation, is simulated learning. So it actually does achieve what it needs to achieve. So where I'm coming from with this is, I would like to come from the role as a medical educator, a role of a body psychotherapist, and ask for an opportunity for interprofessional learning. 
so that what we might have learned can contribute to the promotion of Buddha Dharma. Because every journey begins with the first step and we all have to start somewhere. So, Headmaster, ma- head Dean, Reverend Hui Min, my, my, my Ouxiang, hello, talking to you, yes. <laughs> so, yesterday I want to tell you, I said you have such amazing compassion. You took the time to explain to us the importance of having death awareness in your daily life. But I want to ask a question. Everyone who was here yesterday, any one of you go to bed thinking that you're lying in a coffin last night? <laughs> exactly! <laughs> this is called zhong sheng la. <laughs> Lay people like that. La. <laughs> I know you did not. You know why? I did not too. <laughs> but it is actually amazing practice. The, the, the thing that really moves me is maybe he hoped that some people would do it, but I think largely he thinks no one would do it. But he still, he still say it. This is where true compassion comes in, you know. Round of applause. <laughs> this is what you call bitter mouth grandmother heart. <laughs> oh, keep talking, talking, talking until the mouth also bitter already. Because of this compassion, grandmother heart wants to save sentient beings. Bitter mouth grandmother heart. Okay, so. Last night, I was too tired, like, honestly. I think before I got on the bed, I'm already in the coffin. Uh. <laughs> so this morning, I thought, okay, remember what I mean? Even though we all fail you, I only fail you 50%. <laughs> okay, I woke up, I practiced the coming to life ritual. <laughs> I came to life this morning. So I took this picture from the balcony of my hotel. I woke up in the morning, that's before the sunrise. Okay? Because I'm Brisbane time, I don't feel guilty. La. I'm two hours ahead of you guys. <laughs> so that's why I'm all okay. So I woke up, I look at the sky. I said, hey, I should put into practice what Reverend Hui Ming said. Coming back to life with a rejoice mentality. And the rejoice did not end. It continued as the sunrise. So this is the same, same place. Sun came out. So I always say, Practice is not difficult. The real difficult thing is to keep practicing. Something that's simple is not simple. It's not simple because you have to keep doing that. Professor He, you think easy? ah? Every day wake up at 4 o'clock. Is that what? So I got something right, the, the sequence wrong. So easy. Ah. That is determination. And I can tell you, that is where the strength will come from. So for all people here, regardless you are Buddhist or non-Buddhist, you have to pick a religious practice. So when I say religion, I don't say uh, uh, a institutionalized religion. So if what you meant is kindness, kindness is what you practice. But you have to pick something and you have to do that every day. And I assure you, there will be challenges. Definitely got challenges one. If no challenge, ah, all enlightened already, why still here? <laughs> sure got challenge one. It's just when the challenge come, how do you be with that challenge? How do you acknowledge your humanness in this process and move on from that? But there is no negotiation. You have to do it every day. Why? Why do I have to do it every day? Because you practice all the other dog shit rubbish gao si laps up every day. <laughs> <laughs> the dog shit rubbish you do every day. Your, your greed, your a- anger, your hatred, you do that every day. The same person can always trigger you. Just think of the name and then you get angry already. You do that practice <laughs> diligently, professionally, without laps. I say so and so, I say, yeah, la, so and so. Or immediately go into Zhuang Tai, into the, into the state. If you practice your Buddhist practice like that, la, this room will be empty. Di Zhang Pusa, no business already. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are lay people. We are still here. So we continue. <laughs> okay, so I'm taking another leave out of my training uh, or my profession as medical educator. Is recently, 
um, under the influence of one of my really close mentor and colleague, uh, Dr. Douglas Bridge. Um, he was the director of palliative care in Royal Perth Hospital. He's the one who taught me. He said, you want people to connect with you? You first have to show vulnerability. We had a really beautiful moment just now on the stage when you mentioned that everything is good but you have a failed marriage. That beautiful moment brought everyone close to your heart. That is what vulnerability does. Yesterday, when we have the panelists sitting up here, uh, Richard from, uh, from the state, he said we don't normally talk about ourselves. We talk about theories and things. My teaching is always about talking about yourself. Why? Because if you do not go deep and honest enough into yourself, there is no room to build the bonding. There's no room for vulnerability. There's no room for connection. So, I've got half an hour left. I'll see how quick I can speak through my life story to you. And I'll try not to cry. I'll try. I normally do, but maybe today I'm actually under the weather, so I don't have any energy to cry, then I won't. I'll see how it goes. Okay. So this is where I was born, Ipo. If anyone has been to Guiling or Haolong Bay, Xiangrong Wan, Ipo is Guiling without the water. <laughs> so we've got all the we've got a beautiful mountain. That's me. I always put this picture up in all my presentation because that's me when I was, I think, seven years old. That was my first public speech competition situation that I went out, talk on the stage. I still remember that I was standing behind the stage and I was shivering like that. And I forgot half my speech. Mind blank. Look at people, shake like that. Mind blank. I still got an award because I was so cute. <laughs> but that, that reminds me of where I came from. I was not born like that. I didn't just born and then end on the stage and then can just talk no, no stop which is what all the panelists say is actually a really bad trait just now because they all listen. Hey, honestly, lah, if everyone practice listening, who the hell is going to talk then? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So that's me sitting there looking like a boss. Um, so this would, come, would go up to my growing up in Malaysia. Um, growing up, because I was the last child in the family, um, that at one point was really influential. We have a big factory. With, we don't have 600 budge, but we have 800 workers. It was burned down overnight by fire. So we, we went from the top of the cloud all the way down to the ground. And uh, as the youngest in the family, I always struggle with one thing that is, I always felt that I'm invisible because my parents are very devoted to their job. And I can't do anything enough to excite them unless I'm special. So throughout my life, I strive to be special. It's very tiring. I never realized that. You know, special comes, you know, uh, applause on the stage, people look at you, amazing. But there's always a price to pay. But I didn't realize that. So that's how I conducted my life. Uh, when I'm in the school, I'm always the allocation uh, representative. I'm the singing competition winner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about I wanted to be noticed. I wanted to be special. And uh, I wasn't the smartest. That's why uh, my high school result resulted me only be able to go to the overseas Chinese student preparation school because I can't get into university. It was really bad, really, really bad. I worked really hard. Uh, for nine months, and I got into Kaohsiung Medical University. So I think that is, that is a proof that if you apply your mind, sometimes it's achievable. Um, but the truth, but the problem is, I'm not quite sure I did that for myself. I did that because the whole village thing that I'm so outstanding, you know, like this really outstanding little chap here, I did it more for that. I'm not quite sure I really want to be a doctor. So when I got into the medical school, when they started studying all this subject that I can't connect with people, I felt totally disconnected. Cannot do. Can't do this. So in second year, I decided that I don't want to be a doctor. It's a seven years program. Second year, I told my mom, cannot do this. My mom said, never mind, la. you already start already. Finish. <laughs> only, four more, only five more years of your life. Ma. I said, Mom, I can do that, but I'm going to do whatever I want after I graduate. 
she was thinking she thinks she can control me. Like she thought she's one of those women that control her husband, you know. Like <laughs> <laughs> she was like, okay, after you graduate, you do whatever you want. I still remember the moment when I hang up my white coat after the graduation. I knew that I was never going back to the clinical world. So I went and did a Master of Arts in Life and Death Studies. Of course, against the whole wish of the, of the village. Lah. I was so happy doing that. I used to laugh in my dreams. <laughs> I, honestly, my, 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 my roommate would say, Zhe Wang Zhe, you laughed again last night. Why are you laughing? I said, I don't know. Next time you wake me up. <laughs> you wake me up, I tell you. Lah. So he said, but not in time. He, 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 he sleep at the upper bunker. I go, 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 go. And then he walks up, he come down. I stop already. <laughs> he go back, I go, 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 go. I laugh again. So why? Because I think the reason why is I'm finally close to what I'm supposed to do. To find an answer about what the heck are we doing here. I thought I can't find that answer in the hospital. Because it's not Siji Dashi Hospital. <laughs> because it's a normal commercial education hospital where they do their best to take care of patients, but there is nothing else in there, or there is not enough in there for me to feel that my question of life is being answered. I wanted an answer. I went and did a master's degree. Then, I became a public speaker. A lot of people came to me, want to talk to me, but I wasn't trained as a counsellor to handle that. A lot of grief, a lot of sadness. So I got an opportunity to do an advanced diploma in holistic counselling in Australia. That's, uh, that's Dr. Patricia Sherwood. That is the moment that my life has changed. Because my whole life is about staying in my head, trying to help people, but it's all driven by this inner need of wanting to be loved, wanting to be acknowledged, wanting to be noticed. While I was doing my training for my holistic counselling, even though this is one of my lowest qualifications, it benefited me the most. And that is what I want to bring into the interprofessional learning of this platform. What Buddhists can learn from psychotherapy? Because meditation is designed for enlightenment, not psychotherapy. You can psychotherapy until the cow comes home, you will not kai wu, I can assure you. But you can try to meditate until your pu tuan break, you still have bad relationship with your wife. <laughs> because you don't know how to talk. <laughs> you know, whenever the conflict comes, you go into yourself, Are you paying attention? Doesn't work one. It doesn't work. Because it's not fit for purpose. Toothbrush, brush teeth, brush teeth. Toilet, brush, brush toilet. You take the matong so and you want to brush your teeth. Ah. Cannot. Cannot do that. So that was the moment where my life changed. Because suddenly I realized I have a body. Suddenly I realized what six parameter actually meant that you actually have to come back to your body and through your action and enter the world. But in order for you to come back to your body, you first have to fight all these obstacles that you put in there for yourself. All this trauma, all this thought that I'm not good enough, nobody loves me, I cannot do this, I'm stupid. You have to fight all these layers and layers of obstacles to come to this place, to be in touch with that original intention, that's when the beautiful drama starts. That's when life becomes a lovely, amazing encounter. That's when every day is a challenge, but the challenge is just to make you a better person. But that can only be achieved when we first connect with ourselves. Buddhists, you know, so good at saying, I totally agree with Professor the Bhikkhu earlier, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, very interesting name, but I can't remember. There's a few words from Buddhism that I hate the most. Kan kai. <laughs> I don't know even how to translate that into English. It's not see through, uh, see through, you think garment see through. Is like <laughs> <laughs> it's through seeing, you're letting go. The other thing that I really hate is fang xia, letting go. And another thing I really hate is Ho Zai Tang Xia, live in the present moment. All these words I hate with a passion. Why? 
Because my whole life people tell me that and it never worked. They say, see and let go. See what? You know what you're seeing? If you don't you know, know what you're seeing, see, how, can you, how can you see through? Let go. Do you know what you're holding? Do you know the process of picking up? Are you aware when the six liu gun out there and your liu chen and your eyes and your ears and your mouth, when they're interacting with, the, with all the triggers, the sound, the color, the smell, when the encounter happens, when you reach out, what are you picking up? If you're not aware of that process, what are you letting go? You're letting go through a concept. You will not let go because you didn't even know that it's stuck on your back and you think you want to let go. You want to let go? You go back to the original and first thing, how did this happen? When I see the thing that I like, how did it first happen? But the, the problem is unless you are actually centered, and present, you cannot see the process. It's very quick. And then you keep going around and around and around. And you'll be bored of your own story, but you can't break the toxic cycle. I thought that is what Buddhism is for. It's about breaking the cycle. And Buddha did give us the process to break the cycle. But what is our current challenge? Our current challenge is we are living in such a contaminated world that we need to go from some mental detox before we can benefit from Buddha Dharma. With a lot of people that's practicing Buddha Dharma before having mental detox. So what happened? They then apply Buddha Dharma with a toxic mind and they traumatize people. They are the people who tell you to kan kai and fang xia and then they keep zizuo themselves. <laughs> Not pointing to anyone, don't compare the number and take the seat. Ni dui hao ru zuo, that's your business. <laughs> but that is what I meant. I call that Ran Wu the Sibeishin, a contaminated heart of compassion. They have the intention, but they don't have enough purity in there for the intention to come through. So that changed my life. I'm more present. I go around, I amuse people talking life and death. I draw crowds. 400 people in there, they pay to come and listen to me to talk about death and dying. And I, I really love my job. These are my students, and that's my colleagues. Um, this semester, I'm looking after 580 students. And another topic I can touch on is procrastination, Reverend Hui Min. Took me 11 years to do my PhD. <laughs> 11 years. And this is me having a high five with the Pro Vice Chancellor, Fu Xiaozhang of the university. Because it dragged my, my PhD dragged on so long, I become really famous in the university. <laughs> so when I told the Fu Xiaozhang, who visited Fo Guangshan with me and Su Xing Yun Dasi, he said that when you get your, your certificate, you have to do high five with me. I said, okay, so we actually did a practice. So I, on the stage, I did a high five with him. This is where I work now. And uh, This is all the main influence that influenced my life as a Buddhist. This is my first Buddhist teacher from Ipoh. You might know some of these people because I was um, the president of the University Buddhist Society, so I have opportunity to receive teaching from a lot of great teachers. That's her, Ji Sun Fa Si from Ipoh. And there's a lot of other great teachers that impacted me that I didn't have the chance to actually learn from them, but I learned from their writings, from their thoughts. I still remember Krishnamurti when I read his book when I was 20. He said that truth doesn't exist in any human organization. I never realized what it meant, but I think I've got a bit of idea now. This is my yogi master. He's the one person that I will have to meet every time I go home because he's a true practitioner, and uh, that's where he practiced, in Jilatong, uh, in Ipoh. He goes there every day. He's 70 years old, and he can still do headstand. Headstand, 70 years old, exactly. 
a very humble, amazing person. That's my mother. That's Xinguang Fa Si. And um, the one master that have huge impact on me is Reverend Xing Yun, Master Xing Yun. Uh, because of him, I got to study life and death studies. And um, uh, last year, I, uh, this year, I got back. Uh, I received the Outstanding Alumni Award from Nanhua University. Okay. I spent 30 minutes talking about myself. Gee, you better have learned something because I only got 15 minutes left. What I'm trying to say is the journey. The journey needs you to be present. You need to shed the tears that you need because that's how you can grow. That's how you learn and how you develop. Fame, achievement, it's one thing, but always remember, where are you coming from? When you say, who are you, or this is not you, but who, who really are you? What makes up you? When someone say to me, you know, I don't do this, who is that I? Where did that I come from? How is that I being constructed? I can tell you we're a combination of values, beliefs, and things that we're being exposed to. But underneath that, we also have the amazing Buddha nature. The one thing that's truly you is your Buddha nature. It's none of the other things that add on to it. The one thing that's truly you is your ability to be compassionate and connected to each other, regardless of their race, the nationality, the language, or who they are. But... We are so caught up with all these different things. And Buddhism is a way for us to bring awareness to that. And through psychotherapy, you can actually look into how it impacts you. After you have a clear look, it's actually easier for you to let go. So when I look at the topic, you know, emotional management and getting what you truly want in, in your life, I have a question, but what do you want? If you don't even know who you are, how do you know what you want? So that's, that's, I, I think that's a very interesting question. And the other challenge that we have now is artificial intelligence. This is from the news in uh, Australia recently. Could the robot do your job? You can actually, there's a, actually, actually a search engine that you can key in your job. And then it will tell you how many percent of your job will be taken over by artificial intelligence. <laughs> exactly, I like university lecturer, <laughs> key in. 18%. When I shared it with my student, they all were like, oh, 18%, good luck. I said, no, it's bad. Why? I said, imagine if there's 1,000 academic in the university, 18% means how many is going to go home? 180 can go home. You think the boss is going to say, ah, now you have 18% more time, do whatever you want. Ah. They cut the 180 people so that the other seven, uh, 820 can do the job. This is the future that's coming our way. Are we prepared for that? This is a robot that a child gets. Um, it's a little thing that can communicate with the child. The moment he go, the child gets into the pediatric ward, the robot starts talking, take body temperature, remind when to take medication and all sorts of things. We're moving very quickly into a world that we will not be familiar with. And the only thing we can bring with us is our practice from Buddhism because robot cannot be enlightened. Well, you might be able to write a program. <laughs> and hence, for you to have a comparatively restful mind, we have to learn how to accept, how to overcome, and how to create meaning. It came up a lot, this symposium. How do you create meaning? You have to go back to the concept of what is your belief system. Like uh, what Mr. Chu said, your conscience. Mr. Shu mentioned that your conscience, you have to make decisions based on your conscience. So your belief system is what is guiding your conscience. Your conscience is going to contribute where meaning is going to come from. Unfortunately, most of the time, this is a, word, a phrase that I coined, uncomfortable comfortableness. We have all these things that we cannot do, do not want to say, do not want to see, this is how we look like. But we stay like that because it's actually more comfortable. How can that be comfortable? Because when you open up, you have to expose yourself. You have to be vulnerable. That is scary. Better curl up. <laughs> Continue to curl up and venture to life 
and one day before you have your last breath, you suddenly like, what actually happened? Ah? <laughs> Hopefully you won't be like that. So yes, the question, what do you want? I don't have an answer. I can tell you if you want to get what you want, but what do you want? My friend came and visited me last night. This is another friend from Taiwan. We've known each other for more than 20 over years. You know what we work out what is really important from this point onwards? Not comparing who is richer, compare who is healthier. <laughs> <laughs> so actually what Reverend Hui Ming said to you guys, the five precepts, the five important precepts of eating good, sleeping enough, brushing teeth, he's not joking, you know. Simple, important thing is not complicated. The only complication in the important things is actually doing it. <laughs> Honestly, so yeah, very important. It's going to save you a lot of time for going to the doctors because it's going to elevate all the risks for your heart disease and all sorts of other things just by brushing your teeth. So you see, very compassionate. So I said that already. I can jump that one. Yeah. So one thing I want to bring to your attention, Raymond Hui Ming said, rational decision maker, instant gratification monkey, and panic monster, the three scoops. He said that this earlier this morning. From a psychotherapeutic approach, I would say that the top scoop is the aim to balance emotion and intellectual. The middle scoop is the monkey, which is the inner child. And the green scoop is your unconscious mind. So through psychotherapy, you actually get in touch with your inner child. What is the trauma? Why did the monkey want to have fun? Why did it take me 11 years to do my PhD? Because throughout my whole life, I've been doing everything what the village want. I've never had fun. I actually felt that fear when I was studying medicine that I cannot do this forever. I need to do something for myself. That's what my monkey was telling me. So if you try to use your intellectual mind, the rational de decision maker, to suppress your monkey, no good ending, I can tell you. The monkey is going to come out when you don't know and mess everything up. So you better have a balanced emotional and intellectual approach and create communication with your past trauma, with your childhood experience, with what has be became you today. But that can only be done with you going into yourself and allowing yourself that opportunity to have that discussion, to have that interaction. Like just now, I have a bit of anxiety before I came up. And then I immediately I sit down and I go in. What's going on? Am I afraid that if I don't do a great presentation, they're not going to love me? Even if that is, should I be attached to that? Where is that coming from? The more I fear, the more it's going to impact on my presentation. So my fear is not going to, my fear is actually going to contribute to my worst fear. That is very interesting. So that's time to move on then. So in education, we have different learning domains. We have the cognitive domain, the affective domain, and the psychomotor domain. I think the challenge that Buddhism has at the moment is we're stuck in the cognitive domain. We do not focus enough in the affective domain. The affective domain of learning is the feeling skills. Recognizing emotional response, considering values, emotional response is the main thing. Because when you go to the reverend and you cry, they ask you to fang xia. They don't walk the journey with you. They say, Ay, ni zhe ge xi qi. Bad habit. So cham. Already very sad. Then get label. Get label bad habit. Get label cannot fang xia. Walk out feeling even more guilty. I shouldn't be sad. I'm not a good practitioner if I'm sad. So I should be happy. I'm a happy practitioner. I'm not saying that our reverends cannot do that. They just need some training. They need some psychotherapy training <laughs> to work on this, uh, this aspect. Or maybe they should get some psychotherapy themselves <laughs> before they do anything. Because that is my journey. I learned Buddhism all through cognitive. I was, my first monastic retreat was when I was eight. I was such a zhuang yan chu jia ren ne. Ba sui, eight, oh, eight, year, eight years old. My mom come and tidy my hai ching. I said, Mama, you cannot touch me. I am now a shifu. <laughs> my mom nearly burst into tears. <laughs> my son, my only son, gone. <laughs> so I learned a lot of cognitive things from Buddhism, which is great. 
but not until I received psychotherapy, I got in touch with my feelings. But it's not to say that Buddhism does not have that. I think great practitioners do that. They merge it together. You can see it from their action. But it's just that in the olden times, we are not that traumatized. We do not need to actually draw the, uh, draw the comic and then draw the intestine. <laughs> you don't have to do that. But now, we're living in such a fast, fast place, full of trauma era, some of the things that used to, we can just glide through, we actually have to slowly and walk it through. So don't, don't think that I'm actually happy saying that, you know, psychotherapy, interprofessional learning with Buddhism is a good thing. It's actually a sign of we're actually slowing down. Things that can be achieved much quicker in the past, we now have to do it even more slower. But what do you do? You have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. Otherwise, you will stuck in your head you will be one of those practitioners when you, when you chant your Amitofo, you're totally angry. You go, Namo Amitofo. Oh, that person really owe me Tofo. Like that person. <laughs> Poor Amitabha Buddha. Sitting up at the lotus, nothing to do with you, also got gonna. <laughs> so, uh, coming from that is, in the past, our ancestors, when they are faced with challenge, they can either fight or they can run. But the challenges that we have now is not something that we can fight or something that we can run away from. A simple word that's going to trigger majority of the people in the room, take a deep breath before I traumatize you, is called your mortgage. <laughs> can you fight your mortgage? Can you fight your mortgage? Unfortunately, you have to stay with your mortgage. But like what Reverend Hui Ming said, our three ice cream scope thingy means that we are actually stuck in the animal brain. And how do you balance that? You're constantly being triggered. Your panic monster is constantly there. And all you can know how to do is to run or to fight. But you can't do either. That is where our practice became even more important. So this part... Unfortunately, it's in uh, Chinese. So I'll do a quick uh, interpretation is that healing is a process where you have to recognize your wholeness. And no matter if you're living in fear or when your life is shattered, you insist to not split. Do not escape. You face it because healing is coming from accepting the reality, what it is at this present moment. It's not struggling or asking, or begging, or wanting the thing to be as it was. It's not about that sense of safety that we want to, or what we want. Because if that is what you want, then this is where you get stuck. You'll be stuck here. Or you'll be en you enter into what I said, the comfortable, uncomfortable state. And it's because of the past trauma that we have, that we're actually living a life that's limiting ourselves. And hence, to face those trauma, we actually built a shell to protect ourselves, which is something that you need to penetrate. So when we experience strong emotion, we cringe, we store that in our body, and then we cut off the connection with the external world. Then we won't, we won't want to think about that or realize that. So these are the definition of mindfulness. I'm sure you guys know, but I, but I still, even though you all know about mindfulness, I still want to bring it back to the fact that it is true that if you're able to pay attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally and facing the unfolding experience moment to moment, with this intention of being curious, it's going to benefit you greatly. It's actually, yeah, I won't, I won't go into that. So this is, my favorite slide. I've got one minute and 48 seconds left. If you forget everything that I say today, please remember this slide. Your body is the present. Your mind is the past or the future. Do not let your mind trick you. Do not let your thought trick you. Always use your body as the anchor to bring you back to the present moment. When people are practicing Buddhism, 
when we are preaching Buddha Dharma, when the Tsuji Yi Gong is out there actually doing recycling, they're using their body to bring them to the present moment. They have to be mindful. The, 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 the plastic go to this one, the paper go to that one. These are all mindfulness practice. Their body is engaged into that. For me, that is practice. That is about being at the present moment. So you can forget everything. But remember, always use your body to bring you back to this present moment. Shit will happen in life. Shit actually never stopped. It's just we wasn't aware of it. The older you get, the more apparent you realize that every day is full of shit. <laughs> it is. Left, right, centered. What do you do? What do you do? You take that as an opportunity to remind you of why are you here? We're really blessed to have the, one of the best way to deal with the challenges of the modern era, which is Buddha's teaching. But what we really need to do is to put that into practice. Five more seconds. Thank you very much.